No, I haven't got a Aussies. We're good? Five, four, three. Hello, everybody. Steve Long here, and welcome to our preaching teaching seminar. And for those of you here, we are talking about how do you put together a talk? How do you do an outline? And then we're also going to talk a little bit about the different styles of preaching. Uh, and I'm going to focus a little bit more on expository preaching at the very end. And we're glad that uh, you are here. And because you are here, that means you get to ask questions. So at any time, you just put your hand up and or, and or throw something and just say, I don't understand, and we'll talk about it. Would that be all right? So interactive, not just me talking. And for those of you at home, if you'd like to get a copy of the PowerPoints or keynotes, send me an email at stevelong at catchthefire.com and request PowerPoints or keynotes, and you'll get my talk. So friends, when we're preaching, the challenge is to have a mixture of the prophetic -y kind of things of listening to the Holy Spirit that Patricia was probably just talking about and preparation. And it's not saying that you can't uh, stand up in the pulpit and just get something from the Holy Spirit. I would suggest that for most people, it is better to have a plan and then let the Holy Spirit take over, as opposed to assume that the Holy Spirit's going to give you a word, and then when you get there, you find out that the Holy Spirit was actually thinking that you should have been prepared. <laughs> so that's the challenge of all talks, is having something to say and allowing the Holy Spirit to interrupt that. And in a talk, uh, sorry, let me just go to the scriptures. There's a number of different passages, but Exodus chapter 4 talks about uh, go, this is God talking to Moses, I will put something in your mouth and teach you what to say. And then we have Jesus in the New Testament basically saying the very same thing, where he said, when you find yourself in front of kings and rulers and that kind of stuff, I'm going to help you. So there's that kind of, of um, promise for the, the, you're not prepared, you're not ready, but it would also appear that there's the preparatory work that the Lord is also equally able to inspire and the listening to the Holy Spirit prior to you getting up to speak. Uh, one of the advantages that we have at our church with a team of speakers and a multiple team is that we quite often are assigning who's going to speak on a particular Sunday uh, a month to two months in advance. And sometimes when we have themes that we're going through as a campus or as a church, we are able to uh, actually say, here is your topic for this Sunday and this Sunday. And so that people can have a month to two months of thinking it, pondering it, and, and just doing all those different kind of things, beginning to get stories, beginning to get ideas, however it is that the Lord speaks to you. So we want to talk about how do you combine your experiences? How do you put in all of your, your choices? Like, for example, if you're going to speak on prayer, there is going to be 50 different prayers that you could choose from to preach on. If you're going to use an example of a prayer, you can have the Lord's Prayer. You can have Paul's different prayers that he wrote at the beginning of every one of his epistles. So at the beginning of Colossians, there's a prayer. Beginning of Ephesians, there's a prayer. Beginning of Thessalonians, there's a prayer. Uh, you've got David's prayers. You've got Abraham's prayers. You've got generational prayers. You've got deliverance prayers. So if you're preaching on prayer, you've got a lot of different choices. And how do you figure out which one to do? And God likes to have your stories and your, your goods and bads. And I think that's a big part of preaching is people hearing from you how you're putting the Bible into practice. I tend to be a very practical kind of person when I preach as opposed to a theory person. I like to take the word and say, here's what it means. Let's try it. So if we're teaching on speaking in tongues, we're going to teach about it. And then we're going to say, Holy Spirit, come, give us that gift and let's try to speak in tongues. If we're talking about healing, it's, Holy Spirit, would you come and heal people now? So I tend to be that kind of, of speaker that we're going to do those kind of things. My best talks are the ones where I tell stories. And as you, get a as you have more opportunities to preach and more chances to live, <laughs> you're going to gain stories. And so I look at even negative things uh, that are happening in my life, and I'll say to Sandra and my kids, oh, that's going to be a great sermon. <laughs> because it's, it's a story, and I've got another story. And if, you, if nothing goes good for you or nothing goes b uh, bad for you, you're just having a bland life, you've got no stories. So you can preach from uh, victories, and you can preach from defeat. Yeah. You can preach both ways. 
And the truth is that the people in your, in your congregation that are listening to your sermon, they're going to be having victories and defeats as well. And so uh, my, I would say the best sermons for Steve Long is when I take a passage of scripture, explain it, and now put Steve Long into it. Make it, this is me, this is my life, this is what I've learned, pass those kind of things on. Next, we're going to talk about how do you prepare? How do you get into the putting a sermon together? So let's pretend that you have been assigned that you are preaching this Sunday. You can preach on whatever you'd like to. So let's say you know this three weeks in advance, that uh, Sandra Long is going to be preaching at the airport campus. Did I tell you you're preaching this Sunday? Okay. I didn't, because you're not. I am. So as of now, I do not know my topic for this Sunday. Uh, I haven't heard from the Lord yet. So I need to be beginning to ask that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, early in the week, as opposed to Saturday during the, the second intermission of the hockey game. When I grew up, when I was in, when I, when I grew up, when I went to Baptist seminary and we're teaching uh, Baptist, um, I was learning Baptist ways, the guy who was teaching us on how to preach said the reason why in uh, ice hockey games there's two intermissions is the first intermission is to prepare your morning sermon for Sunday and the second inter- intermission is for your evening sermon. <laughs> so that was Jack Hanna. So I don't know, that's not true. <laughs> So first of all, it's to begin to say, God, what is it you'd like to me to speak on? And it comes all different ways. All of a sudden, it's just a thought. It's an impression. It could be you wake up in the middle of the night, you have a dream. Uh, just whatever different ways, it's beginning to say, Holy Spirit, what am I supposed to talk on? What would you like to say to your people? And let's say the topic is we're going to talk about um, uh, overcoming obstacles. And so it's like, okay, we're going to talk about overcoming obstacles. Where am I going to draw my text from? Where am I going to base this in the Bible? I like to always have a scripture passage. I prefer passages rather than a verse. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. I tend to be more of an expository preacher, even though it may be a topic. I'll define expository by you are giving an exposition. You are giving a... um, You are giving a unfolding of what the passage means verse by verse word by word in in some cases you're explaining a passage and exposit expositing it is that the right word you're giving an exposition you're you're bringing it out so that everyone can see what's going on i tend to do that even on a topical sermon so i tend to like to find one passage stick to it and find that where all of my points are going to come from one one passage so we'll talk about that a little bit later on So now I'm I'm beginning to get my stuff together. I am at the place where I don't necessarily write things down. I have good ideas in my head and I can store things in my head. Uh, But when I was beginning, I would be writing out everything. I used to use three by five uh, cue cards because as I would write down a story, an idea, now I would be able to just do my, um, I would storybook. I don't know if any of you have ever taken writing a a movie script, but that's how movie scripts are written, is it's all these three by five cards, and they'll they'll write the movie on a wall, all the different ideas, and then they're thinking, you know what, we need to put this over here, and so you can just move the card, and all of a sudden, as you got all your three by five cards, you can move this story to here, you can move this point to here, and so I would use that as as the way that I would do it. Uh, I tend to write my notes uh, on laptop now, and I can, again, cut and paste, I can move things all around. Is, is how I do it. So here's the point. Here's how, you, here's how I preach. I tend to like to start, and by the way, when you start, you basically have an introduction. Then you have your content, then you have your conclusion, and your leap into ministry is how we would do it. So you begin it, then you, tell, you talk about it, then you be, wrap it up, and now how do we, how do we p- welcome the Holy Spirit? That's sort of, those, those are sort of the, the different uh, jumps there. I like to sometimes just tell people right out, today we're going to talk about overcoming obstacles, and for those of you that are going to fall asleep during my sermon, here's the three points. And I just say it in 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, when I was in Bible school, the, one of the preeminent preachers in the 1950s and 60s in Canada was a gentleman by the name of Jack Scott. He was the pastor of Forward Baptist Church on Gerard Street in Toronto. His church was one of the largest in Canada, 
And they broadcast at that time on CFRB radio, which is 1010 in Toronto, which was Canada's number one radio station. More people listened to CFRB uh, 1010 than any other radio station. And his sermons were broadcast live on that radio station. And he was a great preacher. And I got a chance when I was in Bible school to travel with him. He was the president of the uh, seminary that I was at. And he would always start a sermon. Today, we're going to talk about overcoming obstacles. I have three points for you. Point number one is this. When he finished point number one, he would say, so remember I said we have three points. We've just finished talking about this. Now we're going to talk about this. And when he finishes point number two, so remember, we got three points. Talk about this. Number two, this. Now we're moving on to number three, this. And all the way through, review, 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 review. So at the end, you know exactly what the sermon was. You've heard it over and over and over. And each point was building on the main point. I was taught to pray, preach three-point sermons. Now, Patricia Bootsma, who just spoke two Sundays ago at airport, had a 10-point sermon. You are absolutely allowed to have a 10-point sermon as long as you're not taking 10 minutes on every point. So the longer your point, the more points you have, the less time you have. And so if you're thinking that you're going to take five minutes per point and you got 15 minutes there and five minutes to set it up, five minutes to bring it to bring it to to land the baby, <laughs> to conclude, and then jump into ministry, there's your half hour. And one of the things I've learned, by the way, is that I don't have to say everything on a given Sunday. I am going to get another shot. I am going to get another chance to preach. And so I don't have to say everything. I can be short. I can be specific on how I preach. Because as the, as especially for those of you that are going to be pastors, my guess is that 40 Sundays out of 52, you're going to be the preacher. So everything you know doesn't have to be said in one Sunday. <laughs> and that's one of the challenges that uh, rookie pastors and preachers have is you say too much. And in you're saying too much, people forget what you're saying. Is that all right? I get compliments all the time of how simple I preach. One of the reasons why I get compliments is I use PowerPoints and because people can see what I'm saying as well as just me saying it even better. And even better than seeing and saying is if they have an outline and they're filling in some blanks. And so most of the time I try to give Andrea my sermon outline with my, my points so they can see it and maybe even write something down because what you write, you're going to retain more than what you see and you retain more in what you see than what you hear. Hearing is your least uh, cognitive, that's not the right word, is your least, uh, is the least effective way for you to retain information. The best is for you to actually do it. So that's why we like to have ministry at the end of saying, well, let's, we're praying for the sick today, so let's lay hands, let's say this and see what happens. And people go, oh my goodness, that did happen. Well, now they've learned how to, how to do something. So I try to state the obvious. I tell people the main point, I try to prove the point, I try to re re review it and remind people that's what we're talking about today. As, I'm, as I get my main, under, main point, what that is, now I begin to listen to the Holy Spirit. I begin to ask the Holy Spirit for jokes, for stories, for illustrations, and begin to put all those things together. Can I just let you know that sometimes your best stories, your best illustrations are ones that you have not thought about. And in the middle of your preaching, all of a sudden the thought comes to you. There is a danger and a blessing in that. Your impromptu stuff is usually your most anointed stuff because the Holy Spirit's fresh on it. And so all the things that Patricia was just talking about, you're right in there. It's live words. It's, it's you're just flowing in the anointing. Number two is, uh, so the warning on that is that sometimes that's going to take you completely away from where you were, so you better know where you were. <laughs> so if you don't have notes, if you don't have something on your paper, you're going to have trouble landing that revelatory thing and putting it back in. And so this has happened to me many, many times. I'm telling an impromptu story, and by the end of the story, I forget what the point was. Yeah. Uh, you've probably seen that at preachers, and you can just see they've, they've, <laughs> what was that story about. It, it happens all the time. It's a good opportunity. And so for me, because I preach through PowerPoints, I, I can usually remember where I was jumping off from. Question. So you do both, like you were listening in advance to what the Holy Spirit said to you, yep. even till ministry time? Yes. But also you're preparing for ministry. Absolutely, yep. How do you do, like, how do you... 
How do you listen in advance and how do you listen at the same time? Uh, yeah. It's just flashes that come to you. Like I'll give you an example. Rob, I'd like you to say a three sentence prayer to bless the food at my cell tonight. We're having pie of some sort. I don't know what it is. Can you just say a prayer to bless the food as if we're in our cell? Okay. Now, did he know all that he was going to say before he began that prayer? None of you know what you're going to say when you start. And as, you're, as you finish your first line of a prayer, your second line comes to you, doesn't it? And right near the end, you've got an inspiration for the next line and for the next line and for the next line. That's all it is in your preaching. As you're speaking, an idea just comes. And it's learning, it's, it's, it's practice on this one, friends. It just takes practice. And I would say at the beginning, if you're not a confident person, you just avoid those things and go with your notes and your sermon's not going to be as inspired. But as you get better, you can just begin to bring in those stories. The other danger is that sometimes I have said things that I've not planned to say and I have put my foot in it a little bit because I've either, sometimes I embarrass Sandra by saying things that have just, like I'm, let's say I'm speaking on judgments and all of a sudden, oh, I remember, and I just tell people, oh my goodness, I, I remember, I just judged that person and I'm saying it out loud and Sandra's now hearing at the same time everyone else is and she's going, well, how come you didn't tell me that? Well, it just came to me. Yeah, but I'm your wife. Is that true, Sandra? And sometimes I tell jokes that Sandra's not happy with. <laughs> okay your teaching notes um, ne you, I think one of the things for our style for Holy Spirit style preaching for revival style preaching is a transition into ministry this I think needs to be thought through how are you going to jump from where you are into come Holy Spirit now you don't have to have it clean like let's say you're teaching on, you've been in a series on the tabernacle of David and you're talking about the el different elements that are there and so you've got all these different kind of, um, you know, you got the, the lamp stands and you got the wash basins and you're going, okay, all right. So I had the, this, I got to preach on the seven lamps, lamp stands. Okay, great. Well, friends, I have no idea how we pray this. So why don't we just stand up and say, come Holy Spirit. That's allowed to just say, come Holy Spirit. Better would be, friends, this is about light. This is about God wanting us to be light. So God wants to use every single one of us this week to be his shining lights. Let's stand up. Holy Spirit, would you come and let us, and you just go into an application. Does that make sense on that? Also, um, what was I going to say there? I'll just keep going. Beware. Any message you teach, the Father will probably test you to see if you believe it. So just know that those kind of things happen. Quite often it happens right after you speak and sometimes it happens before you speak. Let's say you've been given a month to teach on whatever the topic is. Uh, just be aware that the Holy Spirit's going, okay, so you're going to tell other people about this? So what do you, what do you really know? And your best sermons are what you really know. Your best sermons are not, I'm supposed to teach on uh, Revelation chapter 17 today about the third plague. Uh, um, and so continuing in our series, um, <laughs> you, you may have content, but it's probably not going to be as, you know what, friends, this was a, a, a terrible week for me. I was in bed this week with back problems as I was a few weeks ago. And can I just tell you, I did a whole bunch of different things. I was resting. I was taking massages. I was da-da-da-da. But the best thing for me was getting deliverance ministry. And so I, I, as I tell our church that, people are, who also got back pain are going, well, we never thought about that. Maybe it's a spirit. And so just be ready for, for God to be saying, how much would you like to know about this topic? <laughs> and to take you through that. So here's practice. I'd like you to get your Bible out. And I would like you to turn to Luke chapter 8, verses 43 to 48. And I would like you to, and we're going to give you three minutes just for you to read that passage. It's the story of the lady who's hemorrhaging for 12 years. 
and I would like you to write out a three-point sermon. Not the content, just your three main points. So it could be like point number one, she's a lady. Number two, <laughs> she's poor. Number three, she got healed. Those are your three points. Is that all right? Question? Luke 8, verses 43 to 48. So read that passage, and then we're just going to write some of your outlines down. I've got two on the next slide that I've just put together as examples. There is no right or wrong, but here's what I'd like you to do, is as you're reading that, that story, how do you explain the principles of that story in a sermon? If you're going to teach on that topic, on that passage, are you going to talk on prayer? Are you going to talk on healing? Are you going to talk on anointing? Are you going to talk about faith? Are you going to, and what are you going to talk about? Women in ministry, are you going to talk about Jesus? you got lots of different possibilities. So if there's 50 of us putting together a sermon on that passage, we may have 50 different kinds of sermons. It could be that five of you speak on healing but cover different aspects of healing. So take a look at that. For those of you that are watching, I'd like you to do the very same thing. And if you need to just uh, stop the tape... And, uh, you know, join us in a few minutes when you got this part done. You go ahead as well. So I would encourage you, read the passage first from start to finish. Maybe even read it a second time. And as you're reading, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? Just say, Holy Spirit, what are, th what are three key points in this passage? And begin to write them down. As you get better at, uh, at doing these kind of things and seeing the scriptures jumping out to you, now you may even get things where it's alliteration or everything starts with a letter P and you're, you're starting to get some, some like poetic stuff that's coming into your, into your sermons where people, it's easier to follow. I got three points today and they all begin with the letter P. Preach, poverty, pursuit. No, that's just random three words that don't go for this one. But if you get those kind of things, again, it helps people to remember what you said. Doesn't have to be profound, just three statements. How many of you are done? Okay, a couple of you, good. Those are my interns. No, sorry. <laughs> Those are my guy interns. <laughs> no, we're not competitive. We just want to be first. <laughs> that was my thing in school, by the way, is it was competition. I wanted to be the first one done. Didn't matter if I got everything wrong. It's, it's the game was to finish first. I can remember in, in Bible school, uh, Actually, before that, in high school, you'd have exams, and you're given a maximum two hours, and as soon as you were done, you could go. And that was like, great, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I don't know any answer. I'm just done. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Forgive those who judge me. <laughs> now, have you folks just been judging someone when I said that? <laughs> Am I stopping Revelation as I'm talking? Yes, okay, <laughs> One more minute, and we'll let you stop where you are in one minute. Twenty seconds. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> One of the skills that the Lord's given to me, and I recognize that it is a skill, is I can look at a passage and draw out principles very, very easy. I know that that's a skill that the Lord's given to me. Not everybody has that. I would say that that's partly the gift of teaching is a teacher can just see it's this, then this, then this. And it just makes sense. It takes people on a journey. Preachers don't really care for this, then this, then this. They're looking for the big finish. 
A teacher wants to cover the points. They want to make sure that they're accurate to the word. A preacher is wanting to pull out one life-giving thing. An evangelist is wanting to pull out one thing that's going to motivate you to change. An apostle is going to pull out one thing that's going to encourage you. So the different giftings and different offices are going to respond to going to word from it and maybe completely go crazy and have nothing to do with the passage, but they pulled one word out of context. And everyone goes, that was a great sermon. And I'm, the expositors are going, that, that was a terrible sermon. <laughs> that has nothing to do with that passage. <laughs> when I was in Bible school, there was another famous pastor named uh, uh, Backstrom. Backstrom? Tiny little guy. He was pastoring in Chatham, Ontario. And I'd heard about this guy because like, he had a church of 1,000 people back when I was in Bible school in the, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And in my last year, he was the guy teaching us on preaching. And all we heard was how great this guy was a preacher. And in, his, in the class, it was excellent stuff. He taught us the book of uh, Genesis. I don't think we got past chapter 3 in, uh, in the whole semester. So it's like chapter 3 and then chapters 4 to, four to 50, the next, you know, the last session. You know, he just got, there was so much that he's pulling out. The first time that I heard him preach was at the church where I met Sandra, where I was uh, attending while I was in Bible school. And he's preaching on the Sunday night, and I'm all expecting this great sermon. And he stands up, and this is an expositor that's going to go through the passage and make sense. And he goes, friends, today I'd like you to turn to John chapter 2, and it's the story of turning the water to wine. And you remember that there's 10 water pots. I want to tell you about those 10 water pots. The first water pot is faith. The second water pot is hope. And I'm going, where does it say that in the passage? <laughs> it doesn't say anything about the names of those pots. That's not the point of the pots. The pots are not the point. Does that make sense? But an, exp an expositor cares about what the story is. A preacher doesn't care. They're just taking a passage and jumping. Both are legitimate. Both are legitimate. That would be allegorical. Allegorical preaching, yes. And there's a... Not everybody... For that, even the, and the scriptures even say yes. It's, it's, not, not, it's not expository. It's right? not the most accurate yeah. style of preaching the word. Yeah. I'll give you an example of that. Um... Matthew, when he's writing his book and talking about that Jesus came out of Egypt and he quotes a passage in Hosea or Isaiah or someplace, when you look at that passage, it has nothing to do with Jesus living in Egypt for a couple of years as he's a child. Nothing to do at all. It just had the word Egypt in it. Does that make sense? And yet, so the New Testament preachers did use that kind of preaching. Uh, better would be Peter in Acts chapter 2, when he's talking about the Holy Spirit, and he goes back to a legitimate passage that was talking about that, that in the last days the Spirit be poured out. Okay, Aaron, since you finished first, what's your three points? Okay, so Actually, first of all, what, was your, what would be your overall theme? Um, I'm sure our Holy, Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay, let's just stop there. What other topics, general themes, did you go with? Yeah, faith. faith, okay. Someone else, a different topic? Sorry? Jesus notices. Jesus notices. Je okay, notices. Let's just stop right there. Other ones? We're, we're going to get you three people to give us your outlines. Any other topics you had? Humbleness. Humbleness. Transformation. Transformation. Anybody do anything on healing? Yes. <laughs> 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 okay. So what were your three points, Aaron? Sorry, you can. Heal him, right? Yep. And doesn't always reveal everything he is. He doesn't reveal everything. Okay. Okay. Uh, faith lady, what were your three points? Okay, I'm just going to put down the word exercise. Touching heart. And he always responds. Responds. Is that a good outline? Does that tell the story? Yes? What about Aaron's? Would those all be true points from his story? Okay. Um, Ian? Uh, he reaches out. Reaches out. Jesus noticed. Noticed. And wants to meet her. Wants to meet her. 
Good? Let me show you mine. I did two ones. This lady's 12 years of lost hope. One revelation of hope. One act of faith. Oh, I wish I'd done that. <laughs> Uh, so those kind of things, like I look at passages, and I'll just give you an example. I'm looking at, at things that pop out, like numbers, uh, places. Uh, I'm looking for transitions. When, when the word therefore is in a passage, when the word but is in a passage, those are key words for me. And again, just over time, I've learned to look what are, what are key words that actually are going to now help you in a progression. So for example, this gal's 12 years no doctors being able to help her. She spent all her money. One thought came to her, touch the garment, touch the bottom of his foot. And then it's one act of faith of actually doing it. So my second one was talking about anointing. So anointing's for healing. Anointing is tangible and real. Anointing's easy. So there's just all sorts of different ones. Mr. Dan. Can I just real quick give an example of alliteration? Because you mentioned this alliteration. Okay. So the three words I got is failure, faith, favor. Failure? Yep. Faith. Yep. And the last one? Favor. Favor. Right. So if, you're, if you are trying to craft your sermon for people to remember it, if that's a key thing for you, for people to know the word and to have a passage and to make it simple and easy, uh, all of these kind of things that seem to sort of go, like three Fs is fairly easy, and if people take notes and keep their... Uh, keep a note so they write things in their margin and they write those three key words down. If they're going to be teaching a Sunday school class, if they're on an outreach and they look and, oh, I got these three words. I can't remember who did it, but you know what? That's a good, quick little outline. I'm going to preach right now. I got a word. Is that all right? Alliteration. Alliteration. Yeah. So the, the way that uh, these aren't really alliteration, but it's the same sort of thing. I'm, I'm using numbers. I'm, I'm using a key word that just adds. Uh, again, for me, that comes simple. I used to, if, if I have difficulty and I've got, like, say, five points and four of them are really good and I can't figure out the last one, I'll, I'll use a phlephorus <laughs> and l just look it up and try to, try to make it work. How's our time? Perfect. Okay, let's talk about expository preaching a little bit. So this is where you take a passage and you are going to explain the passage and you're going to go sometimes word for word or word after word, phrase after phrase, sentence after sentence, paragraph after paragraph, chapter after chapter, and even book after book. And the classic preachers that you would be reading about and getting commentaries from these are people that, for the most part, preach this way. And they are going into depth. Uh, we, as a church, a number of years ago now, John Arnott began a book, or sorry, began to preach every story from the book of Luke. And we just preached until time ran up, and we'd stop right there. So sometimes it's stopping right in the middle of a story. Just ran out of time. We'll pick it up here next week. So the point wasn't to have a fancy sermon. The point was to explain the teaching of the book of Luke. It took us two and a half years to finish that series. Two and a half. When we finished the last Sunday, we had a big cake and it said, goodbye, Luke. <laughs> I'm serious. That's what we did. We had, a, we had a celebration. We're finally out of the book of Luke. <laughs> Here, some of the... Can you think of advantages of going story by story through the book of Luke? What are you going to get? What's the positives? Chronology, because Luke is, a, is the best chronology of the life of Jesus. What else are you going to get? Context for the bigger, his bigger life. Yep, all the different things that are happening. Luke is the, uh, would be the best writer for putting together the three years of Jesus' ministry. John is the best at the last week of Jesus' ministry. Half of John's gospel is one week. Okay, what are some other advantages? What are the different topics that come up in the book of Luke? For those of you who know the book of Luke. Healing. Healing. Yep. 
His birth, yep. His death and resurrection, yep. Releasing the 12, releasing the 70. What about some other topics? Do you think, the, do you think divorce comes up? Yes, it does. What about uh, faith? What about, you know, there's, there's just all sorts of different topics that can come up. And so if you're trying to cover the word of God, knowing that the word of God is for God's people and trying to give your church a diet of the word of God, one of the best ways to do that is simply preach the books and preach at going through. The challenge in our day is that people are not as, uh, attentive in terms of their attendance in churches. It used to be that everyone was in church every Sunday and maybe you missed two Sundays a year. And so if you're going through the word of God, you can get precept upon precept and all that kind of stuff. People are very sporadic now and their attention span is very short. And so to do a, uh, a two and a half year study in the book of Luke, we may get a whole bunch of people going, okay, this is just way too much for me. When, when are you going to talk about the Holy Spirit again? Well, that's not actually for another year and a half, according to Luke. <laughs> Does that make, so that's some of the negatives of it. One of the good things is if there are topics that come up, you're not seeing as, well, we're just preaching this one because we wanted to preach this one. Like, for, I'll give you an example. It's hard for pastors to preach on some topics, and giving's one of those. People think, well, you're just after money again. But if you preach through a book and giving comes up, now you can preach on giving. And you're not seeing as you're doing this because you're just trying to get more money for the church. And of interest, for those of you preaching, uh, giving is Jesus' number one topic. <laughs> so if you preach the Gospels, you are going to get four or five talks on giving. Does that make sense? So there's some advantages in that kind of thing. You can be topical in being expository. For example, if you are talking about divorce and you come to that passage in the Gospel of Luke, you now can talk about the other places in the Bible, like in Corinthians, at, like in Matthew. You can go back to the Old Testament. There's nothing stopping you from proving your point by going to other passages and just doing, we're looking at this passage today, we're talking about this, and then you bring in all the other things to have a topical talk in a series. Are we okay on that? Uh, we did a 17-week series last year, or sorry, two years ago, uh, our theme for the year was crossing over two years ago. That was a scripture verse that we felt as a pastor that that's the season our church was in. We're, we're crossing the Jordan and moving into possessing, moving into expansion, moving into all those kind of things. And so we began the series, or sorry, we began a sermon series from Matthew. And originally it was just going to be the, um, uh, we, we decided to skip the, the Beatitudes because everyone's heard sermons on that a whole bunch of times. And we just decided we're going to do Matthew chapter 5 and then it got into Matthew 6 and Matthew 7. So it turned out to be 17 weeks. And we just did each different story. So, for example, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, especially in Matthew chapter 5 and 6, there are eight stories about it used to be like this. Now it's like this. So Jesus is reinterpreting Old Testament into New Testament. It used to be that you had to commit adultery to commit adultery. But now it's anyone who looks lustfully is the New Testament teaching now. It used to be that, uh, you know, and he just talks about a whole bunch of different, there's eight of those that are, that are talked about. And so we just took those one by one. So here's, here's an example. So our sermon series was called Crossing into Kingdom Living. And today's topic is salt and light, living a life that reflects God at his best. And it was just two verses. So the whole sermon was based on those two verses that talk about your salt your light. And we define what salt was, we define what light was, and then, okay, what's Jesus trying to say for me? Well, he wants us to be salt and he wants us to be light. And so that was, that was the series. Then the next one would be the next th two or three verses, and that lasted us 17. Comments, questions, before we move on? Okay. Couple things about PowerPoints. I love PowerPoints. I think that PowerPoints help me stay on track as opposed to having my notes. I could have paper notes, but again, I've, as I told you already, I feel that people are better suited to have something that they're seeing. And so I don't have notes. I just use a monitor with this. This is my notes. 
So if there's no PowerPoint, I can't preach. I could preach, but my, <laughs> I don't have my notes any other way. So PowerPoints, what it does for me is it simplifies my sermon that I can only have one point per PowerPoint, per page. I can't be too complex. I've got to make it simple. And I've, I'm trying to get it to, to the place where it's, um, it's all there that people can see it. I'm trying to, it helps me to keep to my notes and it allows everybody to stay focused because hopefully every minute, every two minutes, you're flipping to a different PowerPoint and people who are falling asleep, they're re-engaged again. The reason why you tell a story and tell a joke for good preachers is to keep people connected all the time because people get disconnected. They're looking at their clock, their baby's crying, they're distracted by whatever's going on. And every time you tell a story, tell a joke, people come back in. Same with every time you do a click, people are back in. So there's some advantages from doing that. However, you need to be doing some practical things, like what kind of script are you going to use? So of these scripts, one, two, three, four, five, which is the easiest script to read? <laughs> now, I, I didn't actually use the easiest one that I use. Uh, do, you see my, do you see my title here? That, I think, is the easiest where on, on the, um, uh, see the A here? You got a little squiggly at the end. See at the T, you got little squiggles. Uh, what do you call those? Serifs. The easiest scripts are where there's no serifs. Where, and especially if you were in a church like ours that is an immigrant church and people are learning to read. Because sometimes they haven't learned that that's an A. They've learned that that's an A. Does that make sense? So coming up with very simple uh, fonts that are, are easy to see so it was a little bit of a trick. The top one, in my estimation, is the clearest one. Um, courier? I'm not sure. There's a number of them that are like that. Next one. Use a font that people can read. <laughs> we have so many guest speakers that have, their, that have their notes and give us their notes and put the PowerPoints up, and it's like nobody can see this. For their little screen, they can, but nobody else is going to be able to read this. And it's just a waste of time. So you've really only got like five lines to be able to use. My minimum is a 40 font, 40. And so the, the, the bottom one is a 40. That's a 40. And the larger the room, the less lines you have on your PowerPoint. You've just got to think about the person at the back. It can't be you looking at your screen. The other thing you got to think about is clutter. Like, this is a little loud for people to pay attention to a sermon note. And so finding something that's relatively simple, like that's, that's okay, that's, that's artistic, that gives some, uh, some merit. Very simple. It's the, the background is not taking you away from, the, from the, the sermon. That one there, again, the background's not taking you away. It's a little artistic and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, this is the one that I was using for the most part, and it just looks like it's a page, and we're turning the page. So, but there are lots of ones that are just way out there, and people are going to be, oh, they're going to be beat up by, their, um, by what's happening. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. You can definitely do that. I would say the younger the crowd that you have, the more you want to do that kind of stuff. Uh, when I first got my first Apple, and when Keynote first came out, it had stuff that made PowerPoint look like it was in kindergarten. And PowerPoint's got some new stuff, but like I can do 3D stuff on here. I can make things move around. Like they have cubes that you can flip from one screen to the other. So you can make it almost that it, that's distracting. So somehow you need to do it like where it's, it's okay. So if you were here at the conference this last week and uh, I did a talk and I had like a page turn. And so that was nice and cute, but it's, it's like you can have everything dissolves. And it's like the problem of that, 
the problem of those kind of things for adults is it's taking you out of the spirit and into your mind and intellect again. You want to keep people focused on what's the Holy Spirit doing. So I don't use a lot of things zooping in. If I'm with youth or kids, absolutely do those kind of things. Um, I like to use videos as well. Uh, again, if you were here on, um, at the conference Saturday morning, I, my talk was on being filled with the Holy Spirit, and there was an appropriate video for me to show of a guy who at his wedding, when the pastor is praying over him in the name of the Lord, uh, uh, same of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and when he got to Holy Spirit, the guy goes, ooh. And he just has a Holy Spirit manifestation, if you, if you saw the video, and he's shaking and you know, all that kind of stuff as the Holy Spirit comes on him. Well, it, that little video said my sermon. And you can do that kind of stuff. Can I also say something to you? I don't know if anyone else has said this. The first two or three minutes of your sermon are your most boring. The first two or three minutes is when you're not anointed yet, for the most part. You are getting into the anointing. It's like when you speak in tongues. Uh, who speaks in tongues? Okay. Um, do you want to go? Ten seconds. Okay, stop. Did you make up the first line? Say it again. Okay, say it again. Okay, it started with a sh. Okay, when all the gifts, and my, this is what I, my understanding is, every single one of the gifts, it starts in the flesh, and then the Holy Spirit takes over, and we don't know when. So you start in preaching, you're going to be starting, and you don't know when the Holy Spirit's taking you over, you just know that you're in there. And so that is why a lot of the great preachers, people who are really good, like if you watch Joel Olstein on TV, he's America's preacher now. He starts with a bad joke. Every sermon is a bad joke that, is, that sort of gets you going. And the reason he's doing it at the beginning is because that's, he's not anointed yet. And he's getting into the anointing and it allows the Holy Spirit to come on him in his weakest time is to have something scripted. And this is, this is where in your introduction, a really good story is very, very helpful because as you're telling your story, you don't have to be anointed to tell the story. You just have to know what the story is. But as you're telling the story, the anointing comes on you. And now when you begin to preach, the Spirit's with you. Is that all right? All righty. We are done. Questions before we stop? Yes, ma'am. Right, so her question was, have you ever turned down a topic because you knew you weren't ready basically to give it? Yeah. I would say that that happens a lot. Yeah. So the way around it for me, again, at, I'm, I'm talking to you as a pastor of a church where I'm trying to be giving the word of God to our church. And so over the course of five years, hopefully all the major themes we're going to cover, we're going to talk about prayer, we're going to talk about faith. We're, so we're going to do sermons on a book that we feel are tangible for our church. We're going to do topics like prayer, like fasting. And at this church, we talk about the Father's love. We talk about our values. We talk about inner healing. Uh, we, we talk about those kind of things over and over again. We, do we talk about divorce a lot? No, but we need to every so often. Do we talk about sex a lot? Well, we talk about sex at our church far more than most other churches do because it's, it's an important issue. Do we talk about uh, finances? Yes, we do. Uh, do we talk about, you know, so then, then you got like people studies, like doing a story on the life of Abraham or the life of David or Esther, or it's like, how are you going to get all these passages and all these stories into, into the hearts and the minds of the people? It's a challenge. So the good thing about being in a team is let's say that there's a topic that I know this is not good. For, I'm not really good at this yet. Like, let's say we're going to talk about dream interpretation. I'm not the best at dream interpretation. So being a part of a team, I can go to a Sarah Daly uh, and say, sorry, Sarah Jackson, I can go to Sarah and say, Sarah, I know this is really, like you're good at this. How about you preach on that topic? So the church gets something that's anointed as opposed to something half-baked. 
That's the advantage of having a team. Question. Yeah. So the question is, um, do I stick to expository and or do I do topical or allegorical? I I was trained expository. I, I'm most comfortable with that. I do like topical. I rarely do allegorical kind of stuff. Um, it's not that I can't, but um, I'm a teacher. So I think, Dan, in session one, did you talk the difference between a preacher and a teacher? So those are really the two, different, the two different groups. A teacher wants to take the word of God and make it make sense to every single person. A preacher isn't really worried about that. They're worried about motivation. They want you to do something. They want you to act in some way. And so a, uh, a Duncan Smith, for those of you who know Duncan's style of preaching, Duncan is a preacher. I'm a teacher. I'm very happy to explain the Bible to you. And people go, Oh, well, that's how you do it. That's how people come out of my sermons. Oh, well, that was easy. Where Duncan Smith, they come out, come on, let's take the world. <laughs> you need both. You need both. I am moving a little bit more into the preaching with my role changing. I recognize that my role now is to be a motivator. So I've even noticed that in the last month, that my sermons are much more motivational sermons than they are teaching sermons because I'm not the lead pastor anymore to campus. I'm the pastor for everybody. And so I'm changing even there. Stand up. How many of you have never preached a sermon before that are in this room? Okay. Only a couple of you. It is all about practice. It's all about just doing it and doing it and doing it. And uh, I don't know if you've heard Billy Graham. Have you heard about a guy named Billy Graham? Yeah. And uh, apparently he, at his first time that he was scheduled to speak, he was given like uh, uh, 15 minutes and he had two talks ready to go. And he preached both of his talks in the first 10 minutes and had five minutes to spare. He was so nervous that he just cut, 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 cut. And it was just a basket case. Like he, he, was, he didn't do very well. But that's all right. The Holy Spirit was happy for him to practice and try. Sorry? First time I did communion? What did I do wrong? Oh, my shaking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I was, so ner I was so nervous at a baptism once as I was putting the person down, I said, drink ye all of it. It was, <laughs> it was the communion passage. Oh, stars. In, in my Bible school, we actually, had, we actually went to a Baptist church to, to learn how to baptize people and what to say because there was sort of a liturgy of, you know, how to baptize people, how you serve communion. We, we, it was the same in every church. So the, bap, the communion was, was drink ye all of it as opposed to don't leave any. Anyways. Father, thank you that your promise is you're going to be with us. That's the verse we looked at in Exodus. That's the verse that Jesus said to his followers as well is you are going to be with us when it's our turn to get up and say something. And Father, I'm asking that in the preparatory stuff, in the, the, the days before we get to preach, the week before we get to preach, the, the months before we get to preach, that all of the, the different things that you want to communicate, that we would have ears to hear those things, we'd begin to value them, begin to think through and use our mind as it were, as well as communicating in, in, in the spirit realm and just manage things, put things together. And Father, I'm blessing everyone in this room to become a craftsman of, of putting together talks that are, the talks are not about you and you looking good. The talks are all about helping people to hear the word of God, which can change their life. And we bless you as you keep that in mind. This is not about you looking good in the stage. This is not about you selling CDs. This is not about you writing books. This is about you helping God's people to live and to come into freedom, to come into blessing, come into change, to come into uh, rebuke, uh, all the different kind of things that the word of God is for. And so, Father, I'm asking for your, your hand of favor on everyone as we go through this process. And bless all the different talks that we're going to be having this week. And, Father, in the bigger picture, of after we've heard from everybody May you have a word for us to just say, okay, here's how I've made you. Here's how I'd like you to preach it. Here's, how it, here's your style. Here's your 
your way to communicate. And so, Father, thank you that uh, even in the different people that are going to be speakers in this, um, in this series, everyone's going to have a very different way to do it. And, Father, thank you that there's no one way, there's no best way, there's just your way. And so, Father, we lift off all the pressure of, uh, well, I can't do this, to say, no, you can do this. The Lord will be with you as you do this. And the Lord will help you to get better as you do this. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for your written word. Thank you for the revelatory word. And may we be able to marry the two. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Great. Wonderful. We be done. Goodbye, everybody.